Hi everyone, it's Brendan O'Neill here with an exciting announcement. In October, we'll be doing a special live episode of the Brendan O'Neill Show. I'll be joined on stage by the legendary Rod Little. You won't want to miss this. It is part of an event called Podcast Live in London on the 5th of October, and you can join me and Rod between 2.30 and 3.30 p.m. Tickets are now available at podcastlive.com. There are two types of tickets. You can buy tickets for just the Brendan O'Neill Show, or you can buy an all-day ticket, which includes access to all the other podcasts at Podcast Live. Whichever ticket you choose, whether it's an all-day or a single show, when you go to podcastlive.com, make sure you click the link below the Brendan O'Neill Show logo, as that is the only way you can guarantee a seat for our podcast. So that's the Brendan O'Neill Show with me and Rod Little live at Podcast Live on the 5th of October. Don't miss it. The old word is treason. We are engaged in a highly contentious negotiation with a strong and united and determined opponent. Mm -hmm. A large part of the British political elite have deliberately gone and negotiated with them against their own country. This is another aspect of the elite that I find disgusting. Most of them hate their own country. They regard people with absolute contempt. Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by David Starkey. David is arguably Britain's best known historian. He is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He is a prolific historian on the Tudors in particular. He's written numerous books on the Tudors, most notably on Henry VIII. He has presented TV shows on the Tudors and the monarchy more broadly. From his appearance as a prosecution witness in the trial of Richard III on ITV in 1984, to his role as a history teacher in Jamie's Dream School oh. on Channel 4 oh. in 2011. <laughs> He is a frequent commentator on TV, radio, and in the press, and he has developed a reputation for holding strong, sometimes controversial views. He has fallen foul of the PC elite and censorious Stepford students quite a few times, which I think marks him out as someone worth listening to. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. I want to start off by asking you about what's happening right now at the time that we're recording this. So last night, Parliament was prorogued and it went into some kind of meltdown. There was, the scenes were absolutely nauseating on one level and chaotic and crazy and infantile, where you had MPs holding up signs claiming that they have been silenced and booing and hissing and saying shame as Parliament was suspended, presenting themselves pretty much as victims of a coup like attack on the sovereignty of parliament and on their rights as our representatives. That's not accurate, is it? It is more or less the absolute opposite of the truth. Uh, Marx said, as we of course know, that history happens first as tragedy and then as farce. Well, we're going through the events of the 17th century as farce. What those people were doing, that noble gentleman, I think he was a Scott Nat, who fell across the speaker, uh, who looking as though he was performing an act that we can't talk about. <laughs> um, uh, he was trying to enact, reenact the role of the Commons in 1629, uh, when uh, the speaker was held down to prevent the proroguing of Parliament at the will of Charles the First. Mm. Right. What do the Commons think they are doing? Let's just make one or two big, straightforward factual statements. Mm. Rather than being suddenly silenced with desperate amounts of business waiting to be dealt with, they have sat for the longest single session since the long Parliament. It was 810 days, 
It cost one and a half billion pounds, and they did bugger all. They did worse than bugger all. They buggered things up. What happened, it's very clear, um, no legislation of any significance was passed in three years. Mm. Not only that, they stopped any decisions being taken. We are in a nightmare. We're in weak law. We're in this sealed world that you can't get out of because we're bound into it by another catastrophic piece of legislation, the Fixed Term Parliament Act, mm. which is, do you know what? Again, it looks directly back to the Civil War. Parliament in 1641 passed an act that it couldn't be dissolved without its own consent. It then turns into a vicious oligarchy that sits until 1653 when it has to be chased out at the point of a bayonet by Cromwell. That's where we are. Mm. And it's a parody of this. It's a black, brutal parody. How have things disintegrated? How have scenes of such shocking indignity happened? There are three things. The first is the role of the speaker. The role of the current speaker is a disgrace to the position. The Romans had a phrase, damnatio memoriae, that was visited on bad emperors. The only way the commons will ever be put together again is if a resolution is passed which declares that he was not speaker and not a single one of his decisions will ever be taken as precedent. Why do I put it so extremely? Let's step back. This whole debate about representatives versus delegates, which is the thing that's bedeviled mm. all of this. In legal theory, the members of the commons are representatives. And they have the role that was enunciated in the famous letter to the electors of Bristol by Edmund Burke. I owe you my discretion. Mm. I don't merely owe you my vote. That was... 200 and nearly 50 years ago, when there was no democracy and politics was run by a handful of families like the Marquis of Rockingham, <laughs> to whom he was the paid lackey. Let's get this clear. And by the way, the electors of Bristol threw him out. Mm. Because again, <laughs> you see, there is a very vague relationship between parliament and democracy. We have had parliament for 800 years. We've had democracy for less than a century. Mm. And the great issue was, how do you reconcile the previous tradition of representative in a non-democratic parliament with the position of delegate in a democratic parliament? And the way it was dealt with, this is where all the fuss, all the things that we're talking about, Erskine May, A.V. Dicey, whatever, they all appear at a particular moment of time. They appear in the middle of the 1880s because it's the 1884 Reform Act that introduces something like democracy. Mm. But you see, we've never worked out the relationship between the fact we've got two sovereigns. There is the legal sovereign, which is the crown in parliament, and there is the real political sovereign, which is the sovereign people behind them. But what we did, and this is why Burko's behavior is so disastrous, it's why Theresa May's behavior has been so catastrophic. What we developed in the middle, thanks to Erskine May, the parliamentary handbook, and endorsed by Dicey, we developed a whole series of devices. They were conventions that turned MPs from more or less representatives mm. into more or less delegates. And what are these things? They're party affiliation. They are manifestos. They're standing on a ticket and they're being whipped mm. when they're in the House. That is the thing that binds them to the popular vote. No MP, Dominic Grieve, was not elected in a personal capacity. Mm. He was elected because he stood as a Tory on a Tory manifesto, mm. which promised Brexit. That man did not dissent at the time. His claims to dignity, his claims to acting honourably are 
utterly false. <laughs> he is a shit and a lying, <laughs> deceiving shit from start to finish. And, you know, and an oiled shit. Look at that awful, greasy hairdo. Um, so, <laughs> so we've really got to start calling things by their proper names. Mm. Uh, and, and that's one part of it. The other is Erskine May, uh, are the rules in Erskine May about the procedures of commons business, which gives the government the basic control of the parliamentary timetable. Otherwise, what happens is the House just dissolves into a talking shop, a conflicted talking shop, because, OK, MPs have refused to vote for any deal, but they're, they're strong in the negative. Mm. They're hopelessly weak in, in the positive. They can't agree on anything. I, I simply despair. Um, it's an absurd idea that they can conduct a negotiation. Yeah. So essentially, we develop a series of conventions in the 1880s that turn MPs into something like the representatives mm. of the people. And what has systematically happened in this parliament, we have broken those conventions. Yes. And the system is broken. Theresa May's loss of the election and an absurd notion that you could p keep people with completely contradictory opinions on a main platform of government policy in the same party mm. broke down the whipping system. Uh, Burko broke down the government's control of legislation. And you're then just left with this chaotic mess. That's one of the best summaries I've heard of the development of parliamentary democracy and the crisis of parliamentary democracy today. But, uh, and it follows on to my next question. I wanted to ask you about what you see as the historical significance of Brexit, because it strikes me that w what is casually referred to, particularly by Remainer MPs, as Brexit chaos, you know, this is the big hashtag on Twitter, tw hashtag Brexit chaos, actually is is one of the great benefits of Brexit, which is, is that it has brought back to life a lot of unresolved questions of history. And in particular, the- Terrifying, but terrifyingly so. Yeah, terrifyingly so. I mean, it's like it's lifted a lid off this pressure cooker, which had been bubbling away for a hundred years, probably 800 years, and everything has exploded into the open. I think that's a good thing in the sense that it has raised all these questions yeah, of what good, parliament is it for. It would be a good thing if there was any conceivable possibility of an answer. This is what is truly, truly frightening. You're in a position where, again, because of the Fixed Term Parliament Act, mm. that Parliament can't be dissolved without its consent, of actually being locked into this. It's, as I said, it's weak law. It's like a bad 1960s drama. It's the kind of thing that I produced when I was an undergraduate. At, oh God, they were awful. But, but you, <laughs> you, get, you, you get the idea. And there is no visible way out. And there's another big point that I would, well, the two other points I would like to make. The first is that we've got the history of Parliament completely wrong. Mm. Remember, parliaments, we used to think that the peculiarity about England was that it invented this wonderful thing called a parliament, which gradually all the slower, more retarded nations of the world caught up with, or we kindly gave them, you know, uh, along with speakers, wigs, and all sorts of funny things when we freed the coloured population of the globe, and they were shockingly ungrateful for it. <laughs> anyway, um, this is a totally false picture. Everywhere in Europe has a parliament. Because the Middle Ages, being in many ways much more sophisticated politically than the ancient world, had the principle that which touches everybody must be decided by everybody. Mm. Why then isn't there this multitude of antique parliaments like ours, all sitting there in neo-Gothic buildings in every capital of Europe? Because they were all abolished. Mm. Why were they abolished? The Dutch Estates General, the Cortez of Aragon, uh, the Diet of Poland. Why were they abolished? Because they were hopelessly confused, inefficient, divisive, and wrecked good government. We did something completely different. We made our parliament an instrument of government. Mm. So this myth that the job of parliament is to hold the government to account, to give free vein to backbench MPs, to essentially imitate in a bigger or lesser fashion the behaviour of the 17th century parliaments is the absolute reverse of the truth. The parliaments of the 17th century are not 
typical of English parliamentary history. They are, thank God, the total exception. And again, it's this, this, this insane fondness of the left for struggle and revolution, which are actually horrible and terrible things as one looks at the consequences of every revolution known, apart from the non-revolution, which is called the American Revolution. The, the point about the Civil War, the struggle between king and parliament, every fool thinks parliament won it. It's like, they didn't. Parliament did not win the Civil War, the army did. It led directly to a horrible military dictatorship, the most unpleasant and dangerous regime in English history that is the thing that's responsible largely for the horrible relations uh, between uh, Britain and Ireland. And do you know what? Parliament was abolished virtually as soon as the monarchy was got rid of. So we're dealing with a myth of Parliament. Mm. And one of the great problems is that huge building the Houses of Commons, which is decorated in a committee presided over by the Prince Consort, advised by a man called Henry Hallam. Nobody now remembers who Henry Hallam was, but he's the author of the Constitutional History of Great Britain. And it presents this view of Parliament and the grand struggles between Crown and Parliament as being the birthplace of English liberty. And you get those huge, boring paintings uh, that, <laughs> that happily are now sort of fading and falling from the walls and being preserved at vast amounts of money recording this 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 grotesquely inflated vision mm. of itself yes i, I want to stick on parliament just for a bit longer because it is fa obviously it's a very fascinating institution and an incredibly important one you have written about the way in which for a long period of time voters had a choice between basically two elitist factions, you know, and that's been British politics for a substantial number of years and decades, in fact. And you argued that one of the potential positives of Brexit, or at least one of the consequences of Brexit, is that it has made it a rather clearer that actually one of the great divides in this country is parliament versus the people and the complete aloofness of the parliamentary class and the political class more broadly. Do you think that's one explanation for why we are witnessing such a hysterical meltdown among the political class, as as shown in the scenes in Parliament uh, the day before we we're recording this? They feel like their position has been exposed. They feel utterly adrift from the the lies and the and the pose and the acting they used to do, and now they are struggling a great deal to justify their position. They're not actually making any attempt to justify their position at all. When did you last hear any kind of rational account of what has happened? There has been no justification. On the contrary, they are absolutely invincible in the belief that they are right. Because, you see, they've discovered an idea. The world, as Keynes said, is ruled by ideas. They've discovered this idea called the rule of law. Mm. The rule of law bears an extremely strong resemblance to the rule of lawyers. Yes. A great many of them are very, very well-paid lawyers. And it is an absurd idea applied to the extent that they are applying it. And do you know what? the judges have suddenly begun to waken up to yeah. the fact. If you look at the fate of that, you know, the ludicrous Jolly and Morn, the, the, uh, the attempt in Scotland, <laughs> the appeal to the Court of Session to strike down the prorogation, there was an extremely clear, succinct and forceful judgment that held up, I think, a, a mirror of shame to the English Supreme Court with its diffuseness and its flatulence, uh, which we'd expect from 12 judges, um, <laughs> all determined to have their voices heard. And um, what the Scottish judge said was very simple. There is a political sphere and there is a legal sphere. Mm. And they deal with different things in different ways. And we are going down a deadly route if we confuse them. I'm astonished that Geoffrey Cox, a supposedly miracle working attorney general, hasn't been on the airwaves saying this mm. the whole of the time. We again go back to the 17th century. We go back to the resolution of these terrible conflicts of the 17th century, which took them, remember, from the beginning of the century till very nearly the end. It, there is something like 90 years before the Glorious Revolution of 1688-89, but in the Bill of Rights, which set out the new rules, I think it's 
Clause number nine said that proceedings in Parliament shall not be impeached or otherwise questioned in any other court or place. Right. Now, that was not simply a license for Tom Watson to utter barbed and disgraceful libels on innocent people. Mm. That was not the purpose of it. It was to say that the law court should not intervene in the political process mm. because what the Stuart Kings had done was to use the law courts as a substitute for political process. And bizarrely, the very people who claim to be defending the inheritance of Parliament are going back to this. Yeah. And you know what? It will lead to more headlines that say the judges are enemy of the people, yeah. and it will lead to genuine demonstrations against them. And if they're foolish enough, if the Supreme, if again, the government is stupid enough uh, to refer that utterly disgraceful act, uh, which we can talk about again, binding the hands of the government mm. over the, the question of Article 50 and the postponement of Article 50. If they're foolish enough to accept that case, they are walking straight into this trap. They will become enemies of the people. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. If you like this podcast and Spike's other podcasts, and also the articles and essays that Spiked publishes every day, please think about giving us a donation. Spike's content is free and we want to keep it free, and donations really help us to do that. Head over to Spike's donation page now at www.spiked-online.com. That's a very useful historical reminder of the traditional desire to keep a separation between the political process and the legal process. And I think that Remainers would do well to look into that. But one of the things that's incredibly frustrating, I think the use of the law courts to try to frustrate the political process and particularly any effort to make Brexit happen is one of the key means through which the Remainer elite has has trampled all over convention and democracy and political decency more broadly. With but contempt. With contempt. With, a, complete... with explicit, with open, with dramatised, sneering contempt. Yes. I mean, I used to regard Matthew Paris as slightly more than an acquaintance. The language that he used, I mean, that famous article on Clacton, it makes you want to vomit. Shall I tell you what it reminded me of? Mm. I know this is Godwin's law. It reminded me of Hitler on the Jews. There was that same flavour of contempt, mm. that same sense of disgust. There wasn't yet the call, though we've heard it very frequently, to put them in a gas oven, which has been effectively applied, oh, thank God, they're all old and they're dying. Now, the moment you get that level of utterance in a political community, that political community is lost. Mm. It is completely lost. And I'm afraid, Brendan, that's where we are. I could not agree more with you. I think the contempt that has been hurled at Brexit voters and voters in general, and particularly the older ones and the working class ones and the northern ones and the ones... I happen to be all three. You, are you, I, am, uh, right. I am old, I'm northern, <laughs> and despite the, the, the what was once... what well, you'll, you'll love this. Um, I used to be quite good looking when I was young and I had a really adorable bit of rough. You said, oh, I think you're quite nice, but I can't take the fucking Dutch's voice. But anyway, you know, <laughs> uh, that, that was the price of being not being branded as, as, as a kind of chippy-shouldered northern at Cambridge, I'm afraid. But there we are. I really learned... Speak from the home surface. So that's I, just a word of explanation yes, uh, of why absolutely. I don't sound northern. Uh, and I, 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 I know about your background, and I think it's uh, your your comments on the poisonous contempt that has been expressed at vast numbers of ordinary people are absolutely correct. But I, I guess I have two questions for you folded together. The first thing is, was that contempt always there? And it's now just exploded into the public. Yes. And, uh, and then the second attached... It's the, lang it's the language that used to be kept in the Commons Bar. Yeah. Uh, or the language in, in the Athenaeum. Yeah. Um, it's the, the, lang the language of high table once the butler's turned his back. You know, that's, <laughs> that's... I was very used to all of that. But what's extraordinary, and this is the second part of the question for you really, is... You know, we, we've all read John Kerry's Intellectuals and the Masses. We've all been horrified by the views expressed by the likes of Virginia Woolf and others in the early 20th century with their kind of contempt for the rough-handed... What changes? Now what you realise, exactly, you fast forward 100 years and you realise that those views are all still the there. The Bloomsbury Group won. Yes. 
Uh, and and so uh, I guess the the question is how you know, make is it... love in triangles and live in squares. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right. The squares have just moved. The squares are in Islington. Otherwise, the triangular affairs continue. I mean, look at Corbyn. <laughs> I guess the thing that I struggle with, and I'm sure lots of people struggle with this, because there are people up and down the country watching the shenanigans in Parliament, watching these people say these really unspeakable and dreadful things about the populace, and they are wondering how can you people get away with presenting yourself as Democrats, as as the decent section oh, of the political elite. That's the- they are representative Democrats. You see, there is this, t- they, and again, now let's, re- re- let's now start turning the coin the other way around. There are genuine problems with democracy. Mm. If you go back to the establishment of the Constitution of the United States, one of the most impressive collections of documents that have ever been written on the nature of political communities, their longevity, what makes them rise, fall, disintegrate, they're the Federalist Papers, and particularly the the contributions of Madison and Alexander Hamilton. They are totally aware of the fragility of democracy, that democracy can too easily turn, as it will do under Mr. Corbyn, into the rule of the poor, or the sort of poor, the marshals of the poor, the pigs of George Orwell. <laughs> and has there ever been a better example of those pigs uh, than, than that lot? Uh, uh, the, uh, of the poor over the rich. Um, they knew that no democracy of the ancient world or the Middle Ages had ever lasted. And they did deliberately construct a system of checks and balances that was forms of indirect democracy. In other words, this is why you have that separation between the mass electorate of the President of the United States and the Electoral College. Mm. It's why you have the Constitution of the Senate. And originally, the Senate in America was even more remote from the democratic process, because before whatever amendment it was that's passed, I think, in the wake of the First World War, the Senate was not directly elected. The Senate consisted of two representatives from each state legislature who were sent up. So it was three steps away. And so it is fair to look at that. And there are measures of truth in this. Mm. You do need checks and balances in a system of government. But what is the thing that is utterly shocking about this is Parliament deliberately chose not to do that. Mm. Parliament chose for its own purposes, effectively, the private management of the Tory party and David Cameron and the ridiculous George Osborne, who has to be, I think, the worst politician of the last 50 <laughs> years. In, I mean, look at everything that he did. Whatever he touched was, it was, it was like, Gordon Brown on speed. I know it's difficult to imagine Gordon <laughs> Brown on speed, but it looks like George Osborne. Um, and, and every single error of super cleverness mm. that could be made. And Cameron, uh, in calling the referendum, of course, thought he was going to win it. Do you know how long? The, have you ever looked at the referendum act? No. Disgraceful, Brendan. <laughs> it will take shocking. you weeks to struggle through it. Do you know how long <laughs> it is? Three lines long. Oh, really? There is then an appendix (laughs) of about 20 pages on the subject of election expenses. All the Referendum Act does, it specifies the question and it specifies the day on which it will will be put. In other words, no protections were built into it at all because George Oxman said, easy peasy, we are going to win this, we're going to one project fool, and all those stupid people who didn't go to St Paul's will immediately put their hands up and vote no. That's what happened. But you see, again, what did you do? In theory, and I had this debate with, with, with Elena Kennedy this morning, in theory, yes, the referendum is advisory because of the sovereignty of parliament. But that's the legal sphere. Yeah. The political sphere was that Cameron said publicly and repeatedly, we will honour the results of the referendum, and the leaflet went to every house in the country. That is political. Yep. At the moment, the legal sovereign refers itself directly to the political sovereign on a key issue, on a binary vote. Only a fool challenged that. Yeah. And the argument that because it was a narrow vote, oh, it doesn't count, Every single general election is a vote (laughs) of a few percent one way or another. The landslides of Blair were all secured with a fraction of the number of voters for leave. Mm. We've got degrees of deceit, of chicanery, of double talk, because simply they did not like 
the result. Uh, And they saw it as an act of rebellion. Yes, I think that's absolutely correct. And I think that distinction between you know, the technical correctness the legal, of saying. It, it's, it, you see, I think this, I think, Brendan, this is something we should all be going on about. Yeah. I mean, I'm delighted to be doing this because I think what we now need, and please, uh, Dominic Cummings, listen, you got a first in history and you were taught by my friend Norman Stone. We need, the next months needs to be a crash course of historical explanation. It needs to be a crash course of historical explanation about the nature of government, about the nature of representative democracy, about its relationship of the legal sovereign to the political sovereign. Because you know what? I believe people understand this. Mm. Unlike most politicians, Mm. I go round and I talk to whole theatres full of people, ordinary people, clever people, thick people. Do you know what? There's a degree of passionate involvement. Mm. People want to talk. They want to debate. They're not James O'Brien's. <laughs> Thank God. They, they really aren't. They're mm. prepared to listen. Yeah. They're prepared to question. They have knowledge and experience themselves. And any politician who, instead of throwing slogans at them, you know, we throw slogans at the people like bread and circuses, yeah. the imperial contempt of the political classes and the opinion posters. They are like the Roman emperors of the decadent age. Following on from that, and I think that that incredibly important point between the legalistic description of a referendum as advisory and the political fact that it was, and the moral fact as well, that it was presented. Binding moral fact. Binding moral fact that it was presented to everyone as something that would have real force. And people knew what the consequences were. And people knew the consequences. They weighed them up. They talked about them. They devoted a lot of their time and energy and their votes to this project. Following on from that, I think one of the, and you mentioned this previously, one of the most shocking things that Parliament has done in recent times has been the Hillary Benn bill and the legally enforced obstruction against the executive from pursuing a clean break Brexit and from refusing another extension of the Article 50 process. Because what's striking about that, firstly, it's such an obvious attempt by Parliament to frustrate what is still a significant section of public opinion. But also, they've used this bill, now Act, very openly to threaten the Prime Minister with actual imprisonment, with actual criminal consequences, if he pursues a certain agenda. And I think that comes off as one of the clearest examples of the infusion of what ought to be a political realm with the rule of lawyers and and the, the threat of legal consequences, if you dare to adhere to the, the will of the people. Yes. I mean, I also think, and I was very shocked when Jonathan Sumption came down as clearly as he did uh, in favour of seeing this as a legitimate piece of legislation. Technically, he is right. It was passed by a majority in Parliament and it received the royal assent and that makes it law. But that is not what parliamentary sovereignty means. The traditional understanding of parliamentary sovereignty has been on the notion of solid majorities that endure over time, and laws that are considered, and themselves, although they're not bound to, because you can't bind a sovereign, but observe due process. Mm. The way in which the Ben Law and its latest grieve incarnation were driven through Parliament defied every convention. And normally lawyers are very, very, when they're not interested in the result as they are now. They are very keen that law follows due process. Mm. It didn't. But there's an even more fundamental point, Brent, which is why have things gone so catastrophically wrong? Well, I'm afraid the old word is treason. The old word is treason. We are engaged in a highly contentious negotiation with a strong and united and determined opponent. Mm-hmm. A large part of the British political elite have deliberately gone and negotiated with them against their own country. You see, this is what, again, is another aspect of the elite that I find disgusting. Most of them hate their own country. They don't know it. They spend all their time in the south of France, you know, Cap <laughs> Ferra, you know, one meets the right kind of people there. I, th- I think on the whole, you know, there's this terrible problem. Where does one go? Oh, well, oh no, Kiantish, it's really rather vulgar, you know, people from Surrey go there. Um, <laughs> um, these people, have they been to Scunthorpe? 
have they been to the west of England? And, well, yes, of course, darling, I went to Cornwall beaches. You know, <laughs> do they know anything in the middle? No. Do they know the London suburbs? No. Do they have anything in common with them? No. And they regard the people with absolute contempt. Mm. Now, what this means, of course, is that because they regard them with such absolute contempt, and because they saw themselves as being absolutely right, we have completely trashed the central convention of negotiation, which is, and again, again, where is Jeffrey Cox? Does he actually mm -hmm. know any law? His silence leaves me with very grave doubts. <laughs> the most important single text on English law is Blackstone's commentaries of the 18th century. And again, the leading minority judge, the leading dissenting judge in the case of the Supreme Court, the Gina Miller case in front of the Supreme Court, whose judgment knocks spots off the majority. For clarity, I mean, he said two things that were really very striking. He said, first of all, that what you've, all these so-called rights that can only be removed with Parliament are merely consequential. They're merely consequential on our belonging to the European Union. Therefore, the European Union can unilaterally change them without any intervention of Parliament, whatever. So the notion they depended on parliamentary sovereignty, a grant, was an absurdity. Mm. And the second thing he said was derived from Blackstone. Foreign relations are, have been, and must be the sole responsibility of the executive. Because you've got to have a unitary national voice in dealing with them, mm. not a chorus of conflicting voices, which is what we've got. And you know, for people to go down this route, as I said, it is only possible because you dislike your country. Mm -hmm. See, this is one hope that I have. I wrote a not very favorable piece on Johnson, as you know, mm -hmm. for The Telegraph, and I stand by that. The one, he's got two qualities that matter. One is he's a bit of an optimist. Sunny side up chap. Tummies like that and cocks like that tend to be like that. Uh, and the, the other thing is that, that he actually likes Britain. Mm. And if you look at the old reality of the Tory party, again, perverted with this ridiculous misuse of the word one nation Tory. One nation Tories are not self-satisfied smug gits like Nicholas <laughs> Soames. No, they are not. What they are is their Disraeli's definition of one mm. nation, which is about patriotism and the union of the upper class mm. and the lower class against the nasty, sneery, snivelling-nosed people in the middle <laughs> who are contemptuous in believing universal values and hate their own country. And there is the possibility, now we've got Nick Timothy out of the way, of actually putting that combination back together again. And the Johnson, the sort of Johnson Toryism, if it ever gets a chance, could look something like that. But you know, we recover the most basic constitutional conventions, an act of parliament which seeks to bind the British government in a foreign negotiation has to be, by terms yeah. of process, illegal. I mean, I can. I mean, I cannot understand how this fact is is any ordinary speaker, and the speaker brushed aside the notion that it's transgressing on the prerogative. Not even the basic courtesy, and the House has a means of dealing with acts that transgress on the prerogative. Not even that basic courtesy was mm. followed. I mean, there is another terrible issue in all of this: the fact that we don't have a constitutional referee. And I'm now. I really am. You said at the beginning. I commit heresy. I blame the Queen. I am going to utter the unspeakable words. The fact that she has spent, and whatever it is, year reign, 60-odd year reign, trying to avoid trouble and taking the easy way out in a way totally different from that of her grandfather, George V, whom she affects to believe in, George V, at a moment like this, would have been in the center of the political process, trying to deal with reconciliation, or at least knocking heads together. The formation of the national government, which was a moment of similar crisis, he played a central role, and his private secretary played a central role. The Queen felt she had her hands burned in the whole business of the succession to Macmillan, and has stood back, and that leaves the political process with out an honest broker. In another world, you could imagine the Speaker of the House of Commons. I've only got to utter those words now, <laughs> and we all fall around with laughter at the thought of, <laughs> of, of the ape actually acting as a figure of unity. If you look elsewhere in Europe, this is the general role of monarchs. 
that the constitutional monarchs which are set up, mainly in the in 1830 and the revolutions of 1830, they have a central political role. Um, and until very recently, for example, the Swedish cabinet met in the royal palace. You can still go and look at the, uh, it was literally a cabinet council. It, it, it actually met in the palace. And uh, the monarchs, I mean, it's true of Spain, it's true of, uh, it's true of, of, of the Netherlands, it's true particularly of Denmark play a very, very direct role in the political negotiations, which are necessary because, of course, you have repeated coalitions which are inevitable with proportional representation. Another reason, of course, why the elite love proportional representation, the people never actually get to make much of a difference to the government. Government is a mere conspiracy between the inner circle of the political class that simply rearrange the musical chairs. Or as in Germany at the moment, you have a grand coalition between the alleged left and the alleged right, you know, and mm. it's a stitch up from the middle. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. Subscribe now so that you never miss an episode. And it would be great if you could give us a rating and maybe even a review. That is a really good way to help new listeners discover the show. You said a word there which, I mean, many things you've just said. I said let, many words. Let Too many out, words. <laughs> let out at me. Uh, uh, but one word in particular is treason because it's, it's all, a I think, terrible it, word to use, but it's true. It, it, I think it's completely true. And I think your description, I, I, I think your description of these people as, as loathing their own country and more importantly, their own country folk is very true. And that's one of the, one of the great attractions of the European Union for that class right. of people was precisely that they could. Oh, I and mean, it's a culture. Outsource. You know, it's all about European culture. You know, the English, I think they're really rather brutal, nasty people, you know. <laughs> um, and you just go into a bar in France, you know, and people can drink and they're civilized and they eat pate. Uh, and, you know, they don't, just occasionally, you know, I occasionally go to these awful places and you see them drinking. You know, they're, they're <laughs> sick and they're, co- I mean, really, what kind of place do we come from. It's absolutely, absolutely accurate. Uh, but you, you will be aware, and this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you that when, when you use words like treason or when the Daily Mail says enemies of the people, when the Daily Mail used to be an interesting, more interesting newspaper than it is Rather, I mean, when it lately. Hadn't, when it hadn't been taken over by Georgia Gregg, yes. of course, who is absolutely in the middle of people like that. Exactly. And, you know, even if you say saboteurs or any, uh, use any kind of Strong oh, you're, language. You're, 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 you'll be you're, condemned you're, as a fascist. So there's uh, one of the side issues, I think, although it's actually not a side issue at all. It's, it's, it, I think it's central to the current project of this elite is also not simply to push through all these undemocratic, uh, contemptuous anti people measures, but also to control what you can say about them. Absolutely. And to, uh, and even now I've discovered when I've said this is now parliament versus the people, you will be shot down as someone who is stirring up trouble, who is provoking violence and so on. So the name th- Cox will be thrown at you. Exactly. This, this universal passport too. Yes. Yeah. What's your response to that? You simply carry on saying what you want to say. I'm going to carry on saying what I want to say. I'm not, I am not bound to anybody. I don't have a position uh, in a university. Uh, I have lots of honorary positions and they, they choose to remove them. Fine. I will <laughs> not be silenced. I'm independently not rich, but I'm independently well off and I will say what I want to say. And I will say it as clearly and forcefully as I can. And we haven't yet finished with parliament. Mm. Uh, one of the other things that's gone wrong is, of course, basically, why do people misbehave? What is the central reason that people misbehave in that inane and childish fashion that we saw last night? Fundamentally, because they've got nothing to do. Parliament basically has nothing to do. Therefore, it's filled with idle people who do two (laughs) things. They get drunk on an absolutely monumental scale, look at the bills for Commons hospitality, and secondly, they fornicate. Um, Look (laughs) look at the number of cases of MPs, and it's only a tiny, tiny fraction of those who commit this. Um, And the other thing they do is, because there's one group that is especially totally underoccupied, who are the Scottish MPs who don't really have constituencies, have no constituency work. And of course, the whole affairs of Scotland are dealt with by this preposterous Scottish Parliament. So the only purpose of the, is it 53, 58 or Mm. whatever it is, Scottish MPs in Westminster is to make trouble. 
They have no other function and no other purpose. It is again yet another disastrous legacy of Blair. But if again, if you look at the English Parliament, it is uniquely costly. It is proportionately the most costly legislature in the world. The House of Lords is the largest apart from the People's Assembly of China. Can you imagine? <laughs> Let me, let, let's continue. Um, it sits roughly twice as long as Congress, which has got to rule America and the American empire. And they have make wait days. Did you remember the whole fuss about the note that Boris, again, disgracefully forced into the public domain with that absurd case in Scotland, the note that he scribbled about prorogation, the business about um, uh, Cameron being a big blouse. Mm. Do you remember what it was about? The scribble was on it saying that Cameron was a, was a big girl's blouse for allowing Parliament to sit in September. And I think the phrase was to give the buggers something to do. That what we've got to remember is with Burko's absurd pushing of the backbench MP, the backbench MP by definition is a slightly brighter version of Jared O'Mara. I mean, he seems to me to be fundamentally typical of backbench <laughs> MPs and the fact that he has been out of it for. Mm. What? Has there been a complaint from Sheffield Hallam? Has Sheffield Hallam disintegrated? Are the people wandering in rags and <laughs> you know, scattering ashes upon their heads? No, they are not. So MPs are fundamentally overpaid and underemployed. And you therefore have these preposterous select committees mm. that spend huge amounts of money in absurd inquiries. I know I've appeared before the Education Committee after Jamie's Dream School, mm. and I've never seen such a ridiculous session of self-important little people. Do you remember when Dominic Cummings appeared mm -hmm. and treated them with the absolute deserved contempt? Yeah. Contempt of Parliament used to be a crime. It's now a moral obligation <laughs> for anybody who is sensible. Um, and again, these debates in the annex to Westminster Hall, they're just literally talking shops. And what, again, because these people know no real history, mm. this is going right back to what I said at the beginning, parliaments that just become conflictful talking shops are abolished. And it's not just medieval history. It happened in France in the 1950s. That's exactly what de Gaulle did with changing the constitution of the Fourth Republic, which was parliamentary, into the presidential, dictatorial, plebiscitary constitution of the Fifth Republic. And all of these people go on about how lovely things are in France. France has absolutely no form of serious representative democracy at all. Mm. It is ruled directly by presidential decree. It has a monarchical president. Mm. But that's the risk. If a, parliament if a parliamentary system disintegrates, as this one is doing, that's what happens to it. It's I, abolished. Absolutely. I, th I think no one would weep. Your, your mention of um, Cummings being uh, in contempt of parliament is, is striking because lots of MPs, Remainer MPs, are now saying, what the hell is Cummings doing in this building or around this building when he holds parliament in contempt? But of course, what they don't realise is that vast numbers of ordinary people likewise oh, uh, hold they, they, parliament. These in people are just so extraordinary. Th what's going? What is going to happen as a result of this? Will make the expenses scandal look like a famous storm in the duck pond. <laughs> That's what it will look like. I want to bring you back to Brexit. Everything's about Brexit. No. <laughs> um, but you, you refer to the referendum result as a, as a, as a very British revolution and then the response to it as a very British counter-revolution. And I think the thing, I don't know if, if it's possible for you or me or anyone to give hope to the millions of people who were behind this very British revolution, but it strikes me that the counter-revolution is rather successful at the moment. It's and completely successful. Your point was that, you know, don't, you said don't be deceived by the lack of violence or the, or their good manners. The fact is they're seizing control and this is a coup. Hmm. The great irony, of course, is that there are idiotic Corbynistas on the streets screaming stop the coup at Boris Johnson while also giving the nod of approval to an actual coup against the public vote for, for Brexit. So, Well, that's only a pre preparation for Corbyn. There's only one way out. If there is an election, and there will have to be mm. because we are ungovernable, uh, if there is an election, it is the moral duty of Nigel Farage and of Boris Johnson to come together. If not, they will hang separately. And that may well literally be the case. 
there's, you know, there's a very interesting Angus Wilson novel of the 1970s, which posits civil war. It's astonishingly prescient, but which posits civil war as a result of the debate over our membership of the European mm. Union. A novelist had the wit to understand in the 1970s how profoundly divisive these issues are. And why are they so divisive in Britain? Because exactly of that history that the remain as effect to appeal to, but don't really understand. We are unique in this sense of the importance of self-government. And it's why there was the American Revolution. And it's why, of course, the British Empire decided to head off future American revolutions. It would do something that no previous empire did. With the Durham report, it decided it would actually nurture the great white colonies towards independence and dominion status. And even, of course, the wiser people understood that was what should have been done with India. And it's, of course, the great black mark against Churchill and that he opposed that. So the notion of self-government is built into the English DNA. I, the English, not the Scots. Um, uh, 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 they want to govern other people. Uh, remember, the Scots whinger on about being colonized. They were the most brutal colonizers of empire. Every dubious company in Hong Kong and Shanghai was Scottish. The whole of the rig banking system of Canada was Scottish. Right. Anyway, uh, uh, after that, after that little rant against our, <laughs> I'm a northerner, that little rant against our northern friends. And why, where does it come in? It's Henry the yeah. Eighth. Yeah. It is the first Brexit. It's the break with Rome and the, the first real declaration of national sovereignty and parliamentary sovereignty is Henry VIII's Act in Restraint of Appeals, which says that no foreign power has jurisdiction in England. It's Queen Elizabeth um, at, uh, at Tilbury uh, against the Spanish Armada in 1688. You know, I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, uh, but, but, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, yea, and a king of England too. And I think it foul, come on, we can all do it. And I think it foul scorn that Philip of Spain or anyone else, you know, should dare to transgress. That's there. It's real. And of course, oh, the, oh isn't that really oh, that kind, kind of patriotism? It's so vulgar. Isn't it? <laughs> anyway, but Henry V, isn't it? I never really liked Henry V. Isn't it nice that he's now being convicted of atrocities at Adric? Oh, Aaron Cool. Um, uh, hadn't we better go there, my dear? There's a lovely new museum that's terribly anti English. Don't you feel instinctively really a bit ashamed of being English? I was going to come to Henry VIII because you've written so much about him and you are the foremost expert on Henry VIII. And one of the things that you say, as you've just said now, is that. In some ways, the Reformation in England and, and Henry's break from Rome sowed the seeds of what has become Euroscepticism. And hmm? I, I think 500 years of propaganda. Yeah, right. I remember my mother. <laughs> uh, my mother was a typical Northern Puritan, though she didn't realize it, uh, and, and a product of all of this. And my first school trip was to Rome. The look on her face, you know, the whore of Rome, the whore of <laughs> Babylon and all the rest. And she couldn't quite put it to me. <laughs> I was 12 or 13. I still remember my mother. Rome, wash your hands. They have very funny toilet habits. <laughs> and, you know, all, all, of, all, of that, all of that propaganda. But there's another point, Brendan. Now, let's be serious. But it's very important to laugh about these things as well. But let's again be quite clear. This is what is so shocking about the perversion of the notion of parliamentary sovereignty. Mm. Parliamentary sovereignty was created to further national sovereignty. Yeah. And the notion you can separate parliamentary sovereignty from national sovereignty is a, is a vile antithesis. You cannot do it. And of course, the Remainers do it all the time. Yeah, that was my next question, because it strikes me as so patently ridiculous, this notion that... The people who are currently devoting their every waking hour to keeping us in the European Union, to keeping us in this globalist, oligarchical, explicitly anti national, anti democratic, anti, -democratic, anti nation state institution. They, Empire. I mean, my old, col my old colleague, Alan Sked, uh, you know, was, who is a real founder of UKIP and the man, of course, who destroys the English political career of Chris Batten and deserves the plaudits of the nation for so doing. He said, 
the EU is an empire. And it's like all multicultural, multilingual empires. It's serviced by a multilingual elite who view the, the populace below them who are a lot of monoglot peasants with absolute contempt. Mm. It's as simple as that. Absolutely. It's as simple as that. And the, the, the absolute farce of these people claiming to be defending parliamentary sovereignty at precisely the time that they are weakening national, national sovereignty. sovereignty. It's, it, is, it's, it is absurdity. It is, But again, you see, it's because that most of them read PPE at Oxford, which means they are fundamentally politically illiterate. It's a, de <laughs> it's a degree designed for the totally superficial like Cameron. When Vernon Bogdanor said that Cameron was his most brilliant student, I think that tells you everything you need to know about Oxford PPE. I have one more question. I have a million I more questions. I hope you didn't do PPE. I didn't do PPE. <laughs> You'll forgive me. Um, I have a million more questions, but only time for one more, which going back to the points you made incredibly well earlier on about the absolute blind, stinking, seething contempt that these people feel for the masses, for people in Scunthorpe, for people in Merthyr Tidville, for people around the country. It strikes me that one of the one of the most striking things about Britain in the 21st century, but also a thing that makes perfect sense, is that we have a political elite, a political class, a media class who have no appreciation whatsoever for the ideal of national sovereignty and its relation to parliamentary sovereignty. And we have vast numbers of ordinary people who do have an appreciation of that and an and understanding of that. That is the of only that. thing of hope. As I said to you, the possibility of the reconstruction of the Conservative Party as Disraeli imagined it. Between those of us in either the educational or the, the as it were, uh, the elite by birth, who actually believe in Britain, love the country, have that, I can't walk past the Abbey without that sense for a thousand years. I tried to give it in the programs mm. that I make. I tried to give that sense of it's what Burke was really about, uh, that a nation is a community, a contract of past, present, and future, the, the sense that we are standing on the shoulders of these people uh, and their achievements, and they are part of us, and we will hope to pass them on. Um, and that absolute shallow contempt mm. that assumes that the past is nothing, that the past of one's own country is nothing, and mere abstract reason. The Blair, the whole enterprise of the Blair government to declare the year one, mm. to try to be a kind of peaceful French revolution, is catastrophic. It produces things like the absurdity of Lord Falconer trying to abolish himself as Lord Chancellor and discovering the term was written into so many acts of parliament, he would have had to have repealed half the statute book uh, <laughs> in order to do it. And um, absurdities like the creation of a Supreme Court. How can you have a Supreme Court when there is no separation of powers and the executive is actually in the legislative. And again, if we hadn't been so stupid as to abolish the position of Lord Chancellor on this principle of rational separation of powers, French, of course, Montesquieu, uh, they can't understand complicated things. It's what that rather narrow, simple logic uh, leads you to. Do you imagine we would have had the denigration of the courts, the destruction of the dignity of justice, the uh, impossibility of ordinary people actually Anybody who is not desperately poor or desperately rich cannot have proper access to justice. Mm. This is this is a national shame, and it has arisen directly from the application of false commercial uh, calculus uh, to things like the law courts. I mean, okay, I've been coming over as a Tory. There are aspects of the last 40 years of Toryism which I am so deeply ashamed of that it has gone, that it has elevated everything into the false god of money and money relations. Toryism is not capitalism. It's not red in tooth and claw capitalism. Mm. This is a complete misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. There has to be an attachment to a notion of a national community. There has to be an attachment to a notion of serious institutions. Again, the conservatives, de the destruction of local government under Heath's pit, Keith Joseph vomit <laughs> is utterly shocking. The counties, as any Yorkshireman will tell you, are absolutely central to the history and the lifeblood of England. You deliberately destroyed their legislative function. 
That is not a conservative act. That is an act of destructive, hyper-rational liberalism. And the one good thing that may come out of the purging of the Tory party, it will get rid of the hyperactive, super rational liberals. Because liberalism, let's again look at it, Swinson, liberalism is an utterly destructive creed. If you apply reason to everything, you destroy everything. Marx understood that. There is no beauty, there is no love, there is no aesthetics. There is nothing but money relations. And that is horrible. David Starkey, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.